getting into a more systematic overview of Java threading. Now, you've been introduced to a lot of this stuff already, so some of this is going to be recap. But I want you to have a good understanding and know where to look to find out more information about this stuff. So first of all, let's just talk briefly about what threads are in, in general. Um, a lot of the stuff that we get in Android comes straight from Java. So if you know Java threading, then Android threading is pretty much the same, although there's more stuff that it does above and beyond what Java does, as we talked about before. So let, let's talk about two, two different views. There's a conceptual view and an implementation view. Conceptually, a thread is a unit of computation that runs in the context of a process. And you can have multiple threads in a process. And typically, the way it works in Java is you have multiple threads inside of a virtual machine, a Java virtual machine, which runs in a process. So, but that's the idea. The threads are running inside of a process. And threads can communicate within a process with each other, either by passing messages to each other through queues, like the kind of queues we were just talking about, although hopefully with better synchronization. Uh, or they can also use shared objects. They can store data in global variables and then just make sure they're coordinating uh, and having mutually exclusive access to those variables. There's also an implementation view. And we're not going to go overboard on this, but it's important to realize that the Java implementation in Android has some Java stuff, and then it also has some Linux stuff. And we'll talk more probably next class about how this works under the hood. But at the moment, there's certain state information that's part of each individual thread. So things like the stack, every thread has a stack. Every thread has a program counter, which is keeping track of where it's executing in that, uh, in that program. And it also has other registers, frame pointers, various registers for storing results of certain kinds of computations or function calls or th those kinds of things. So that's all its unique state. So there's certain things that are unique in a per thread basis. Thread specific storage, for example, or what Java calls thread local storage. There's also state that's shared between other threads within the same process or the same virtual machine. This is the common state. So this would include things like the global heap. When you say new blop blop, that comes out of the global heap. And there's also, of course, static memory, which are sort of the global variables that you might have, which in Java, of course, uh, largely come out of the global heap unless you have things like you know, integers or something like that, built-in built uh, types. But everything else is going to be allocated out of the heap, but some stuff is stored sort of statically. Uh, and that's common. So that's one way you can coordinate and interact is by passing information or, or updating values that are, that are shared in either the heap or the static data areas. OK, any questions about this view of threads? Hopefully, you guys have all seen this before, but it's important to have those two perspectives. All right, so let's talk about how you program Java threads. So in order to program a Java thread, you have to give it some code to run. And there's a couple different ways to do this. One way, which is, is very, quote, simple, is to extend the thread class. So you have a thread class that's built in class. You extend it, and you overrun or override the run method. And here's a very simple example that uses a named subclass. So here we have my thread, which extends thread. And it defines the run method. That's where your code goes that does stuff. Then you would come along and make a new instance of my thread and start it. And then magic happens. And we'll talk about the magic as we go further along. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is to implement the runnable interface. So we have the runnable interface. It has a method called run. Uh, you can read more about this approach here. And in this case, we're going to implement the runnable interface and fill in the run method. And there's two ways to do this. One way to do this is to have a named subclass as the runnable. So here, my runnable is a runnable. And it has a run method. And now we create a new runnable. And then we go ahead and make ourselves a new thread with my runnable passed in as a parameter. And then when we start that thread, then the run method will get called on the runnable. <coughs> so that's one way to do things. The other way to do things is to have a so-called anonymous inner class as the runnable. So here, we have the runnable interface, which we don't directly implement uh, by, by implementing it. I mean, we implement it, but we don't say implements. Instead, we say new runnable. We provide the code here in line. We pass that to a thread, and then we go ahead and we start that thread. So those are two different ways to do things. 
we're going to see that this particular inner class idiom is used all over the place in Android. Very, very, very common thing to do, and it's used a lot in Java. I'll come back and talk about pros and cons of this approach in just a second. All right. So regardless of whether we do things with a named class that extends thread or a named runnable or an anonymous runnable that we pass to a thread, which could be anonymous or not, right? All these different choices. Regardless of what we do, when you create, when you create a thread and you start it, some magic happens underneath, underneath the hood. And that's done, of course, by Android's runtime libraries in conjunction with the virtual machine, in conjunction with Linux. And we'll see how this all works a little bit later on. So what's going to happen is you say new, you make a new thread, you call start. That will allocate a new stack of activation records. And then you call run, and this guy starts to run. Now, the thing that happens once you call uh, run, so once you call start, then the thread that runs in run executes concurrently with whoever called start. So in this particular case, this is the, an onCreate method it's calling back on an activity. And we're assuming this is running in the UI thread of Android. But of course, in general, it could be some other thread. And the cool thing about this is that these different threads of control can now block independently of each other. One can be blocking on, or this one here, the background thread, can be blocking on I.O. or a file or whatever. And this thread could be interacting with the user. So we're now able to have things running concurrently. You can generally put any code you want in the run method of a thread. So this is where your code goes. Uh, obviously, in Android, certain limitations are imposed, like you can't use user interface calls from a background thread that you spawn. You can only do those in the main thread. But uh, that's, that's sort of an Androidism. As long as the run method hasn't returned and an exception isn't thrown that propagates outside the scope of the run method, the thread can continue to be considered to be alive. And in fact, there's a method called is, is alive or something like that. And you can check that to see whether a thread is still alive. Not a common thing to do, by the way, to call that method for reasons we can talk about if you're interested, but you can do it. However, under the hood, Android scheduler, which works kind of in conjunction with the Linux scheduler, can suspend and resume a thread many times. So if a thread starts to run for a long period of time, then it may logically appear to be running but every once in a while, like 100 times a second, Android Linux will wake up and say, I'm tired of this thread running. I'm going to suspend it for a while and let someone else run. That's the job of the, the thread scheduler to do all that kind of stuff. And in Android, that's a combination of Linux and Java working together. If you want a thread to run, quote, forever, which sometimes is good, sometimes is bad, depends on what you're trying to do. Uh, then you need to have some kind of infinite loop. So, you know, while true, blah, 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 blah. Obviously, you rarely want a thread to truly run forever. Uh, you want it to loop and be able to be shut down. And we'll talk later about how you can shut threads down next class using interrupts. When a thread, uh, a thread is no longer considered alive after run returns, which, as Robbie mentioned before, could be for a variety of reasons. When it returns, the join method from another thread, called from another thread, can be used to synchronize on the completion of the thread you're joining with. So that's one common way of knowing when something's done. There are other ways to know as well. When we talk about countdown latches or cyclic barriers, you'll see some other techniques that can be used. Uh, or you, know, you can either join with it, or the thread can just disappear. There's nothing, no, typically no harm in that. When the thread is done, it's gone. Nobody ever waits for it. Nobody ever knew it was there in the first place. Perhaps nobody even knew it was gone. Right? It's like Eleanor Rigby. You know, people didn't even come to her grave. It was very sad. Um, the Java virtual machine will recycle the resources associated with the thread. So when the thread goes away, that stack, the registers, the state, blah, 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 gets recycled. OK, any questions about that? Yeah? Who's Eleanor Rigby? Eleanor Rigby. It's a Beatles song, Eleanor Rigby. It's, uh, if, you, if you Google Eleanor Rigby, it's a very famous song. She picks up the rice in a church where a wedding has been. She lives in a dream, waits by the window, wearing a face that she keeps in a jar by the door. Who is it for? All the lonely people. So anyway, great song. I don't know why I know those kind of things. I can't remember my, my parents' birthday, but I know the words to you know, Eleanor Rigby. 
there's a couple of types of Java threads, user threads and daemon threads. By far, you're going to run across user threads. I just want you to be aware that there are daemon threads. So you have a process. You can have um, various kinds of threads in there, user threads and daemon threads. When a virtual machine starts up, it starts out with a main thread, with one main thread by default, uh, which, by the way, also doubles as the user interface thread in Android, but that's another story. User threads and daemon threads differ in what happens when they exit. That's how they differentiate themselves. When the main thread exits, other user threads will continue to run, and, and actually daemon threads for that matter as well. So, so when the main thread exits, other threads that are user threads or daemon threads will keep running. However, when all user threads have gone away, the daemon threads will shut themselves down. So the purpose of a daemon thread is simply to keep running as long as there are other threads going on. But when all those threads shut down, they shut down themselves automatically, which is kind of interesting. When all the threads have gone away, including the user threads and the daemon threads, the Java virtual machine itself, the process, can go ahead and exit. Daemon threads are used in a handful of places in Android. The, these are the only two places I could actually find in the packaged applications. You know, packages, apps, browser, packages, apps, email. They use daemon threads to do some stuff kind of in the background. Data controller and a file cleaning tracker. OK, so let's take a look at an example. And I'm actually going to bring up an editor to show this. Well, first I'll explain the program, and then I'll show you the code. Um, so this is a simple example. You can get it here at the user daemon thread directory. And it's going to compute the uh, GCD of uh, two numbers. And if you launch it with no command line parameters, then the main thread creates a user thread. And that user thread can outlive the main thread. If you run it with a command line parameter, it creates a daemon thread, and that exits when the main thread exits. So those are the two different modes that the program can run in. Let's go ahead and see if we can bring up the editor. And we'll find the example. So this is called user or daemon thread. All right, so here is here's the, the, cl the class itself. User or daemon thread extends thread, and it gives a big max iterations. And uh, it's passed in a parameter that says whether it's a daemon thread or not. And if it's a daemon thread, it becomes a daemon. It calls the set daemon method, which it inherits from thread, by the way. And it sets the thread type, which is a string. Here's the greatest common divisor, which is the largest positive integer that divides two integers without a remainder. And we're doing this recursively just for fun. We're just burning up CPU cycles, really. Here's the run program. Here's the run method. It, it runs, and it goes through, and it generates random numbers. And then it goes ahead and computes their GCD. And every uh, 10 million iterations, it prints something out just to let you know it's still going. <laughs> And so that's, that's the user daemon thread. And then if we go over here to the test program, you'll see that this thing checks to see whether or not you gave it a, um, a command line argument or not. It's a daemon thread if you gave it a command line argument. It's not a daemon thread if you didn't. And it then goes ahead and creates either a user thread or a daemon thread. It starts that thread. And then it has the main thread sleep for one second. And again, I won't run this in the interest of time. I won't run this program. You can do it yourself to see what it does. What will happen is the, the main program will go ahead and start. You'll see that it says entering main. And then a second later, you'll see it says leaving main. And if you ran this thing without any parameters, even after the main thread is left, you'll see that the background thread keeps computing GCD till it's done. If you give it a command line parameter, then you'll see that the background thread will compute a couple of times, but when the user, the main thread leaves, that thread in the background shuts itself down because it's a daemon thread. So just a simple example to illustrate the difference between user threads and daemon threads. OK. So that's one thing. Then the other thing I want to show you in, in our limited time left 
Um, here's, a, here's another example. This one's going to use runnables instead of threads. Okay, so let's go take a look at that example. So that example is up here. That's called user or daemon runnable. And as you can see, here we have test runnable. Test runnable uh, is the test for the runnable. And what it's going to do is it's going to go ahead and create a runnable, which is not a thread, which we'll see in a second. And then it's going to go ahead and create a new thread using the runnable as a parameter to the thread. And then it's going to do more or less the same thing as before. The main difference here is that the GCD runnable implements runnable and extends random. And I just did extends random to illustrate one little point. If you extend the thread class directly, you can't inherit from anything else. But if you implement a runnable, then you can inherit from something else. So that's the only reason I did it, just to show I can inherit from something else. So this is a runnable, and its run method um, basically does exactly the thing that the other one did, except now it's a runnable, not a, not a thread. So why would you choose one of these things versus the other? So very quickly, the reason you would choose one versus the other uh, is the, for here's some things to keep in mind. So using th extending thread is really simple. You, just, you have a thread, you extend thread, you're basically done, right? The problem is that it's somewhat limited because you have to inherit from the thread class, which means you can't have any other superclasses. And it also somewhat tightly couples you to threads, which may not be what you want, as we'll see in a second. Implementing a runnable, in contrast, has a few more pieces because now you have runnables and now you have to make a thread. And so you have to connect those two things together. So it's slightly, ever so slightly more complicated. But the good news is it's more flexible. And the reason why it's more flexible is because now you don't actually have to use the thread in order to run the runnable. In particular, in Android, you can come along and you can use the hammer framework. You can put something into uh, you know, the UI thread and have it run that way. Um, or you can also use the executor service. So in the last couple seconds here, um, let me show you this last example, which is daemon executor. And let's go find that guy. And this is kind of cool. So what, what we do with this next example, the daemon executor example, if I find it, there we go. Um, this has exactly the same runnable implementation that we had before. So if you were to go back and look, it, it has exactly the same runnable. There's no difference in the runnable implementation. However, the way in which the thing actually gets, oops, the way in which the um, runnable gets launched is now controlled by something called the executor service. And an executor service is a user, it's a useful library that's part of Android, or part of Java, which is also part of Android. And you can make a, a pool of threads. So we can make a pool of five threads or whatnot. And then we can go ahead and we can run these commands in the pool of threads. So if you have you know, n cores, you could create n threads in the pool. And then you can go ahead and scatter around the commands to run in those threads on those cores, which will make things transparently more scalable without you having to do anything else. You just basically create the right kind of executor implementation and then just give it runnables to chew on. And the cool part here, if you take a look up here, all we had to do was to find something called a thread factory, which is a factory method from the Gang of Four book. And the thread factory simply determines how we create the thread. And so this particular thread factory will go ahead and, and um, make the right kind of thread with the right kind of runnable and so on and so forth. So anyway, the point of all that stuff is that by using the runnable approach as opposed to an extending thread, implementing a runnable instead of extending thread gives you additional flexibility. So uh, we usually recommend using that approach, but it's important to know that people also sometimes extend thread for very simple use cases.